All right, welcome back everybody to another episode of the Dreamer Optimism Podcast. Today, we are very lucky to be talking to my good friend and colleague, Mr. Simon Mostafa, who's currently located in Southern Spain, but he's been all over and done all sorts of really interesting things. And we're gonna let him talk all about that. I first met Simone when we were in grad school together at the University of Colorado. We were in the environmental engineering program and affiliated with the program called Engineering for Developing Communities. So where science and engineering and design intersects with um, efforts ostensibly aimed at sustainable development for uh, so-called developing countries or less developed regions, that sort of thing. Um, and then he's gone on from there to do many interesting things, which I'm sure we're going to get into today. So with that as a little intro, Simone, would you like to give a little thumbnail sketch bio of yourself and um, uh, yeah, just take a conversation where you'd like to go? Sure. Thank you so much. Thanks, Josh and Jason, for, for putting this together. And uh, yeah, so, I mean, biography just depends on what angle you want to take it from. Typically says, you know, where I grew up, where I'm from. You know, I, I grew up in Venezuela. I, I'm, uh, my mom is from Italy. My dad is Venezuelan, but his dad is Palestinian. That's where I have this mix of, of names in me. And then uh, we migrated to the U.S. That's where I got my degrees. Uh, including what uh, what Josh mentioned, we got our PhD there together at the University of Colorado. Yeah, doing this thing, um, environmental engineering with a focus on on developing communities and all the good things and contradictions that that involves. And then um, when I was done with that, I had this desire to do a few things. I wanted to work in that line of work, you know, this this uh, area of, of development, and uh, however that that's defined, you know you know make working with 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 people to improve uh their lives and their communities and this kind of thing and using our knowledge and uh, advances in science and technology to improve people's lives and not just to you know exploit the earth or each other um but and, and i also wanted to travel and and one of the main contradictions that i had was that i i didn't want to do this work from the u.s looking down towards other places so when i graduated i went i just grab a backpack and I said, I'm going to go backpacking, traveling, and along the way, try to find work uh, doing, you know, in this, in this field of, of work. So that led me to uh, what I call a non-institutionalized postdoc, you know, for the, for the following five to seven years, just traveling around mostly Latin America, participating in, in different projects that can be broadly characterized as, as, as development or, or, you know, or, or, or aid work or whatever you, know, you want to call it. And mostly in rural communities, uh, Mexico, Puerto Rico, uh, different countries in South America, uh, some in Africa as emergency relief um, and things of that, of that nature. And, and recently uh, I, I moved to, to Spain and this is where I am right now, uh, kind of in between this, uh, looking back phase of, of this work and uh, a bit of a existential crisis as of, of questioning or re-questioning all these things, you know, things that we go, I think we go through these cycles of, of, of great certainty and great uncertainty and questioning things, which I think is, is healthy. Um, and then maybe I'm, I'm, I'm at one of those periods of, of questioning a lot of, the, a lot of this, these things, you know, the, the work that we do and, and the meaning of, of the work that we do and, and how we want, how the big question of how can we live a life that is uh, consistent and coherent with our, with our values and with the world we would like to live in. Um, so with more questions than answers, mm -hmm. that's kind of where I stand now. <laughs> okay, well, I, <clears throat> I know one of the um, experiences that you spent quite a bit of time with during this period, during your, um, your informal autodidact postdoc experience uh, was uh, you spent a lot of time in Chiapas in Southern Mexico, working uh, on community health and water and sanitation and that sort of thing. And I remember talking to you at one point about it. And of course I'm thinking, oh, you know, Simone's not, he's a native Spanish speaker, he's a piece of cake to travel in these kind of places. And then you remarked to me about how a lot of the communities that you're working with, you know, Spanish is not their first language and most of the language, most of the communication is not conducted in Spanish, but in local dialects and stuff. So maybe talk a bit about your experiences there in Chiapas and um, 
the kind of stuff you're working on, but also I think a dynamic that comes up for a lot of us is a sort of like insider, outsider, and uh, how we relate to people that come from like a real different background. Um, even when you're a native Spanish speaker and someone would maybe naively think that that would be easy for you in that situation. Yeah, definitely. That's really interesting. That's also what I thought. And one of the things I thought when I was deciding where to go to to work after graduation, I said, you know, Africa is a place where a lot of people go to, you know, the country of Africa, you know, this <laughs> massive, diverse place. And we just look at that thing. I was like, I'm just going to go to Africa, like, you know, anything of what I'm talking about there. And I felt Latin America was a little bit closer to something that I could wrap my head around, you know, with, with the cultural, you know, growing, growing up in Venezuela and being a little bit culturally closer to other places and having the language they said maybe the place where I would like to go and explore and, and, and participate in this kind of project as you mentioned yeah mostly water and sanitation will be in Latin America and that's where I went yeah and then I ended up in southern Mexico where you have in the rural areas you have predominantly indigenous communities in the Chiapas region some of them are completely autonomous like you may have heard of the, of the Zapatista communities which are, are undergoing their the the you know the, their own process uh, of, of being completely autonomous and then there's a lot of uh, diverse rural communities there that yeah that do not have like language uh, Spanish as their primary language you know so they maintain their their pre-Hispanic language you know um, so then yeah so then even myself going there I was kind of an outsider you know and like I mentioned I didn't want to go from the U.S to work in South, in South America or Latin America because I felt a lot of this, you come in with uh, establishing a relationship of, of power, you know, and sort of this neo-colonial kind of uh, tint to it, whether you want it or not. And I was trying to avoid that, but then I found myself pretty much exactly in that same situation and with those same contradictions, you know. Me being from the city, whatever that city would be, going to the rural areas, and speaking Spanish to to native uh, to native speakers, um, so so then yeah that, that was that was that was like a really a big eye opener for for me on itself you know because to the story that I was told even in South America and and this what that opened up to me was this vision of of there's not just like an up and down you know there's just like all these levels where where power and colonialism and oppression and on this economic and other type of forces exert themselves at, you know? So I was just like, maybe not going from the US to here, but I was going from the city to here. And it's still, uh, it can be still like a, 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 a power a power dynamic, you know? Mm -hmm. So I had to like really try to humble myself and recognize my privilege, a privilege that I was trying to avoid or pretending not to have and just recognizing that again. And so it was just like a, a big eye-opening experience of. Of, uh, of of learning to I don't know to listen and 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 try to to communicate and and to create a real exchange of of knowledge and communication with uh, with those with those rural communities um, and just the, their way of life and the richness of their community experience and, and all of that all of that you know and I was really fortunate I think to to be accepted into into that I want to say into that community but into that collaboration with those communities to do this, uh, to do this kind of work. Hmm. You mentioned the, the Zapatistas. Um, I've, I've, I've read a bit about them, but since you have first-hand experience, I, I know that they have this, they have this um, concept of Zapatismo, which is this idea that, you know, that, like, they, like they, they encourage people oftentimes to create their own autonomies wherever they happen to be, right? And to bite the, um, colonial or neo-colonial power structure, like, like wherever they happen to be and create these autonomies and then create these kind of networks where these solidarity networks of kind of knowledge exchange a, a, across, at least that's my understanding. Um, and I'm wondering how you think about your desire to kind of travel and help out these communities versus this alternative approach of like, okay, I'm gonna just pick some place, maybe it's where I'm, I was raised or maybe it's a new place where I'm gonna be here long, long term. Right and and you know develop a community, um, and and then and then have kind of a solid basis to exchange with other communities. Um, so it's more of a reciprocal relationship rather than kind of a, you know, what what can be kind of this weird contradiction you're describing of I'm going in to 
to, you know, to save these poor people, which is just this horrible paternalistic attitude. And I, I'm wondering if you, what you think about that notion of kind of rooting yourself and then, and then having this reciprocal relationship across, this, you know, these solid, solidarity networks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that, that is, on, on the one side is a, that vision of, of rooting yourself and having a solidarity network is, is I think, something that I, that I would envision as, as, a, as a really good way forward. And uh, sort of a, on, on, the, on a big scale, kind of uh, just thinking from a social or political perspective. But then on a very personal level, the idea of, of the rooting, it's, mm -hmm. it's a big question to me because, um, like I mentioned, I was, was all those places I named, I, I was raised in Venezuela, but I actually was born in the U.S. just by chance. But by the time I was three months old, I was already on a plane to Venezuela. So that's where I grew up. And Spanish is my first language. But then, you know, I was living in the U.S. with a U.S. passport, but I, was, I always felt like an immigrant in the U.S., mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And uh, now I'm in Spain, and this is the first time I'm starting a, a, a proper garden in, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. outside my, my, my house. So the question of, of root is, 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 is a big one to me, you know. Do we, do we all belong to, to, to a place, and, and is our life kind of a mm -hmm. search for, for, that, for that place? Or do we get to pick our place, and, and it's a place where we feel at home, and then that's where we... And that's where we that are roots and um, well, whatever the answer to that question uh, is, I think the second part of what you mentioned, rooting yourself and creating a network, I think is uh, and creating a network of, of, of equal exchange and mutual aid and, and all these sort of things. I think it's, it's definitely a way a way forward. Um, but uh, I don't know. Maybe I hear I can I can pass along to Josh because I think his his experience with with rooting and and reconnecting with the land is. It's very different, you know. I feel, uh, you know, if, I don't know if, if, it's, if it's a good time to pass it along to Josh to introduce yourself and your and your project. And because to me, like what Josh is doing is part of answer of a really good answer to that question. Where I have a big uh, personal question, I feel Josh is provides a good answer. That one that I that, that is quite inspiring to me. Well, <clears throat> I, I don't think I have an answer. I was going to like just kind of keep deepening the question. I mean, you know, what you're talking about is something that I'm kind of trying to do, you know, uh, and we're starting finally with this project. And I just turned 45 years old last month, you know, so <clears throat> that's a late start at, at becoming rooted. You know, I feel like I'm lucky. I just feel personally very lucky that, I, you know, I came from Appalachia. That's a cool place to be from, you know, and I just feel uh, grateful about that. But I've done this whole circuit that's really, really common for people in our culture. You know, where like if, you, if you're a kid in grade school and you, and you do go to school, meaning you get good grades, you know, then you get put onto the college track, right? You're supposed to go to college. You go to co and then usually you move somewhere else, you go to college, and then maybe you move somewhere for a job, or then maybe you move somewhere for grad school. And <clears throat> you get kind of inducted into this pipeline of like a real cosmopolitan approach. And it's interesting. And travel is fun. And it is cool to live in all these different places. And I, you know, I grew up in a little town in West Virginia that was really economically devastated. And I've gotten to live all over the world. I got to live in California, in the Bay Area, and I can see all these different things. And I'm super grateful for that. But there's very little about that experience that um, conveys what, now we're talking about the importance of being rooted or finding roots or making roots or whatever. And it's something I think a lot of people in our cohort, you know, if we even get to the point of recognizing that's an important thing, then it's like, well, how do we create it? How do we build it? How do we find it? It's like this journey. It's not like you just, it's just all around you your whole life. You have to kind of find it, you know? And I think you're like the, what you're just saying, you know, you're born in, you were born in the U.S., but then moved to Venezuela and then came back to the U.S. And, you know, and so, so the, the question that I was going to ask you is, you know, um, to what, okay, to what extent, and we all want to get to the, to talk about the stuff that you're working on now in Spain and your experiences there and give a picture of that. But to what extent is this kind of quest for rootedness and to find a place you belong, is that part of your path through these different experiences? What, what are you finding about that? What are you finding about the challenges? What are you finding about, how have you figured out how to do that to the extent that you have? And, you know, do you have any perspectives to offer? Because I feel like, you know, 
the emphasis for so many people is to go away and get a college education and become a quote unquote global citizen. Well, to me, it doesn't make global citizen is a nonsense term. Like, what does that even mean? You know, to really be a citizen of a place, you have to know it. And to know it, you have to be there and know its particularities. And you can't know that about everything, you know? So it's just, I feel like it's a, it's a real bizarre situation that we're in and it's really confusing. So I want, so I, I, you know, I want to turn it back on you and ask like, when you've been embedded with these different communities where you're an outsider, what have you witnessed? How's that affected your personal growth process? And to what extent is this rootedness a, a factor in what you guys are working on there in Spain right now? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a really, that's, 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 yeah, that's a huge question for me. Yeah, because I mainly feel like uprooted. Uh, like the, the two places where I have lived the longest in the first part of my life, you know, Venezuela and the U.S., are two places where I go and I don't feel my roots are there anymore. Um, you know, and then when I, when I, so that's, so yeah, I guess my, my travels were in part, are in part that, 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 that search for that, that place of, of, of belonging, you know, and, and it will be maybe a chosen place uh, where, to, where to set the roots, uh, you know. Um, yeah, I, and like you said, maybe if you don't, if you don't come from a, from a place that you know deeply from, from your tradition and your family and your, and your past and your lineage, then, uh, then, then how do you do that, you know? You have, you have to be in a place, stay in a place for a while, you know? So one thing that I've, that I've, that I've learned is to, yeah, to slow down, you know, maybe instead of tr trying to, to travel and get to see as many places as I, as I could, you know, like, Sometimes you do that, you know, when you're, you're like backpacking, I'm like, I travel, you know, I did 40 countries in two days. It's like, okay, I don't know how that worked. Uh, but, uh, <clears throat> it, you know, just like slowing down and getting to see a place and to feel a place. And, and yeah, and, and then you see the, 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 the diversity and the commonalities uh, from one place to another. And then just find the place where you, where you, feel, where you feel comfortable. So I feel here is just one more place in a chain of, of, of experiences, you know, that, that, uh, that, that, uh, that I'm moving through, that I'm now moving through with, with my partner. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and here is, is a place where I feel comfortable, but I don't necessarily feel, yeah, maybe like, like the roots are, are here, you know. And, and another thing is also we, we tend to think a lot even, even as I mentioned, you know, it's a story we tell, just to repeat the narrative, not because it makes any sense, but we said, we, I visited 10 countries or 20 countries, you know, and we still think in terms of countries, which is a very, I think, like outdated, um, you know, way of, of thinking and interpreting the world, you know, and, uh, and this is something that, that the Zapatistas have kind of uh, pointed to, or it's one of the things that, that the Zapatistas have brought to light, um, just to, to come back to them. Uh, they, they kind of, pointed to how the, 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 the country level, you know, it, it's, it's, not, it's not a scale that's, that's useful anymore, you know? There's, there's, a, there's a community level on your, on your ecosystem or your watershed or whatever area that you're actually affected by, your community, you know, a, a real area that affects you and that you can affect and you can know and that you can connect to and where you can belong to, um, and, and, that's, and, that, and that's real. And then there's also like this global scale, not to be a global citizen, uh, like you mentioned, but, but understanding global processes and are our part of that. And then there's like this weird in-between thing that's, that's not useful anymore, you know, which is, which is a country, the country level, you know, because you go to every country in the world and then there's the struggles are the same in every country, you know, are the same companies in the you know the same things and the people doing the same type of resistance so the struggles are local and are real and the problems are real and the solutions are real and the culture is real at this community level and this global context that's happening is is also global and common but the in between the country you know the country level the president that's that's at the top is the same puppet in, in all of them so that's kind of like a not a useful scale to look at anymore so I don't know. I kind of went into, into a different direction there, but anyway, I think this this the the the, the rooting part comes at this at this micro level, and and I think that the the type of life that we develop there is connected to this to this global you know uh, 
um, kind of thing, which is, I, I guess I'm just repeating a bumper sticker here, the one well, the thing global, act local, just a really long way of, <laughs> of saying that. Yeah, there, there's two phrases or two concepts that, that I think you're describing that really help clarify things for me. And one is thinking bioregionally, which I think is kind of like thinking both in terms of ecosystems, but also culture and, and cultural ecosystems. And then the other is, I like this term, cosmopolitan localism, which kind of gets at this idea that we want to be rooted, but we also don't want to be just inward focused, right? We like in order to kind of counter hegemonic power structures, we need to be networked with each other, right? And we need to supporting each other. And so there's this interesting tension of like, you know, balancing both of those and having them work synergistically instead of each one, the local and the and the global network kind of uh, cannibalizing, you know, each other for attention or something. Um, and how do you, you know, how do we find that synergistic relationship between the two? Um, I was just thinking, because so, so I live about an hour away from Josh and I'm, I'm pretty new to Southern Appalachia and I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I traveled quite a bit as well and I don't, you know, I don't really feel rooted where I, where I came from. So I, I'm kind of in a similar boat where I had to kind of like, you know, travel for a while and now I feel like, okay, this is a place where I can, I can see myself being for a long time. Um, but I was just thinking that maybe Josh and I need to convince you to come out here <laughs> since since you're since you're on the market anyway, you <laughs> we're trying to attract like-minded folks to like make Southern Appalachia the most awesome bioregion in the world. <laughs> um, I, I really I'm really curious to know more of the details of like what kind of engineering. I know Josh is is does a lot of like low tech, you know, appropriate technology engineering, um, working with communities. Is that the kind of thing you do as well? And do you want to, do you want to talk a little bit more about uh kind of your specific skill sets yeah 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 sure so yeah so yeah broadly they're 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 very similar you know they're appropriate technologies for mm -hmm. for water and and sanitation and you know what makes them appropriate will be you know just considering what what the resource what resources are available you know both human and material and, and you know economic resources are available in, in a region in a community mm -hmm. To see whether to see what what type of of, of, uh, of solution or, or project or, or or thing to do with life, uh, you know, is is appropriate in that in that um, in that context, uh, you know. So yeah, we're basically focusing on on you can broadly call them, you know, kind of um, they're mostly like low tech, you can say. Um, treatment systems, you know, things that do not require a whole lot of, 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 uh, of uh, resource inputs for treating water, you know, either treating it at, at the front end to make it drinking water, to make it potable water, or to, to treat it, uh, you know, use the, the wastewater and reuse that, 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 uh, that waste stream uh, as, a, as a useful resource, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, for wastewater treatment, you can have things like, uh, treatment ponds or constructed wetlands uh that kind of thing and for and for water treatment you can have uh simple things like uh slow sand filter um for disinfection you can have various things you know and, and this and this will all be appropriate depending on the, on the cultural and economic context uh, that you're in you know whether you want to disinfect water with chlorine or with uh, uv light or with a well uh operated slow sand filter with activated carbon which josh can tell you all about um you know it, it's about finding the 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 fit for the for the communities you know so in, in the different regions where 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 i've worked it's it's a matter of uh, you know first of all this if the, if the community if 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 the quality the water quality is a concern you know for for these communities uh, you know, what are, what are they willing to, or what are they want to do about it? You know, that's, that's uh, the, the, the first question and what can be done about it. And, uh, and if they want to, yeah, tr treat their water, then it's about finding, finding a solution that, that fits those needs. You know? And it will be very different whether you have, you can pump underground uh, water, you know, or, or you can, or if you're, uh, you know taking water from from a river you know like the amazon river 
you know, it's a completely different mix. And then the technologies that, that you use for that um, will, will, will vary uh, greatly, you know. So that's oh. mostly what I, yeah, what I, what I learned and, 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 the, and the projects that, I, that, I, that I've been working on the past few years. Go ahead, Josh. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so all three of us have, you know, to a greater or lesser degree, been involved in academia currently or in, in parts of our lives. A lot of people in the Doomer Optimism sphere have some relationship with academia. And um, uh, I would say that I, I am of the opinion that academia and universities, as they're currently construed, are <clears throat> um, in misalignment with actually being able to prepare students uh, and conduct research that is appropriately tuned to the types of crises that human society is facing and the types of challenges that we're facing. Um, and that there is a big mismatch between what's going on in academia and real world problem solving and the sort of energy and environmental and economic realities and that, you know, of, the, of the future and of the near future and of the sort of future that we're living into during our lifetime. So that's my opinion. So what I wanted to ask you was, you know, what's your opinion on that? And how do you see the role of universities and academia uh, involved addressing a lot of these issues? Do you see it transforming? Do you see most of the action taking place outside of those formal structures? Do you see some other kind of meta structures forming to address these things? Or what's your take on that? Yeah, that I mean that's that's a big one. I mean, I guess I see academia as as part of the system, like any other part of the system. It's it's there mostly for you know to serve as a certain segment of the population, but just by I don't know things that happen on the fringes of it, like maybe where where you or I find ourselves, in, we we try to find things that are actually good, you know, and we and we try to do things within the systems that within the system that we would do outside the system if we had complete freedom, you know? Um, I mean, like, I don't know how, how to put it, but I mean, I think, I think cer certain things in academia, like anything else are useful, but, but, but it's just really inefficient. And the reason that is, is because they're not designed for improving, you know, they're not designed to save the world and improve the, the quality of life of people and, and making and extending, uh, you know, the, 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 um, you know, our, 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 our good time on this earth, <laughs> you know, they're kind of, they're kind of there uh, as part of a, of, 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 a, of a bigger system. Uh, you know, I don't know. I, 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 I range sometimes on, on how cynical I can be about, um, about academia, you know, but uh, on a good day, I say it's, you know, it's, it's our best attempt, you know, to advance knowledge and, you know, we're, we're doing what we can and, and, and this is what we come up with. And then the other day I say, it's just, it's just part of the, a part of the system, you know, it's just a way of, of classifying ourselves and, and uh, giving the markets uh, signals of who has degrees and who doesn't. So we can have a, a scarcity of, of professional and, and specialized uh, labor as opposed to unskilled labor, which should be uh, infinite to, uh, you know, to lower the, its, its cost, you know? Um, so I don't know, maybe, maybe we, we can take on the, on, the, on the good side of it, you know, academia does a lot of it coming from, you know, from like uh, public funding and stuff. It does have, have, you know, it does provide some space for for generating for for generating uh, useful useful knowledge, you know, and um, yeah, and and I think actually you Josh have 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 navigated that road also, you know, very very consciously, and and have have <laughs> you have come face to face with those uh, contradictions like like head on, you know. So I don't know if you wanna if you wanna share some of, some of those experiences, you know, like I think we. Because I feel like like we share this this idea that we, we have this this vision of the world and we we go into academia or we try to work with the system or within the system uh, to maybe take some of the resources that the that the system can give us that we cannot do on our own. Um, but then we're 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 constantly negotiating, you know, in this spectrum of being completely outside the system and academia, 
working with it or working within it, you know? Uh, I think you have navigated that, that, that uh, very, I don't know. Yeah, I think you have an interesting experience to, to share from that in the last few years of navigating that in and out. Maybe as a subject of a future podcast, but I think really what we're trying to, I'm trying to squeeze as much wisdom out of you as I possibly can whenever I get to talk to you. That's always my goal when I talk to you, you know, because I mean, the reality is, the reality is, you know, I mean, you know, we could go into some detail on your PhD thesis and talk about, you know, radical oxygen species and natural organic matter and surface water, water quality stuff. And it's fast, super fascinating, super important, like really, really fundamental, hard nosed science stuff so you can go into all that kind of stuff and if you wanted if you would have wanted you know the sort of traditional you know research or teaching professor career in academia you could have had it but you sort of you know stepped aside and you've taken this tortuous path around and I think maybe there was some consternation you know some people in our program like why would you do that Simone you know could, could, could be a top professor at Harvard or whatever if you wanted to um, and I think you know with, you've had good reasons for choosing the path that you have and um, you know, and, uh, so I guess, I'm, or let me say, so an item in the news today that I've been seeing passed around is the current cover story, uh, of the economist magazine, right. very, very forward thinking radical economist magazine, uh, has, it says a coming food crisis. That's the, that's the story in the economist, right? And we're looking at goals on it. With what's that? And the wheat, the, the wheat plant that they have on the cover has little skulls on it. Yeah. It's so, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, we're obviously we're in a situation currently where we've got some seriously concerning geopolitical stuff going on and the, war, the proxy war between the U.S. and Russia over Ukraine, you know, fertilizer crisis, uh, wheat crisis building up, um, fuel crisis, we're looking at possible rationing of diesel fuel on the east coast of the u.s this summer so it seems like you know a lot of this kind i mean for those of us who've been like warning about the risks and and calamities associated with unsustainability for a long time we're starting to see a lot of like the you know the symptoms of that kind of thing i mean a global disease pandemic you know is is one of the many kind of things that can really send shutters through a fragile vulnerable global economy and we're and, and we're seeing these crises like we kind of have just rolled from one crisis into the next into the next into the next so you know is this a case of proximity bias where i'm assuming that the things happening around me in this time now are are are, are more um consequential and important and fast moving you know just because i am not taking a long view on history uh or um are we really seeing a kind of uh potential acceleration in these manifold of interlinked ecological and economic crises, you know, and is, is that what's going on here? And, you know, does what effect, if any, does that have on your path, the things you're working on, you're thinking right now, you know, if, 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 if a young person were to come along, you know, 17, 18 years old, they're trying to decide whether to go to college, whether to work on this, that, or the other thing, what, what kind of advice would you give them, you know, considering these like up to date kind of like, wow, the world is kind of a crazy place right now. Wow. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I'm good for, for advice. I mean, I, I can just talk about, yeah, like, like my personal path, it's just been a path trying to reduce uh, contradictions, you know? Um, and, and, I mean, I think I think there are certainly things that are that are accelerating and, and getting worse, like on a on a global on a global level. Um, you know, like things, yeah, with like like the economic and on and, and 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 the ecological stuff just like collapsing and and falling apart. And that stuff is already broken and falling apart. And right now, it's just showing more and more and more symptoms, right? So, um, and then there's. Uh, and then there's 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 everything that comes as a as a reaction to that, which are all the things that can give us hope, which are the people you know working on the ground at, at, at the small scale at the ground level, trying to to you know prevent us from from doom, you know, which is like the the, the point of, of this podcast, right? And so it's this the, the, that that duality, right? And and I think I don't know going back to the Zapatistas, I don't know why I I guess there's they have been really inspiring. 
for me uh, in, in many ways. And, and they, they're, they're really simple people in a way, you know, in the way that they're, they don't, they don't, most of them, they're, they don't have, um, you know, academic degrees and in political science and stuff, but they, but they have led a badass uh, revolution that, 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 that's actually still in place. And you can tell from a lot of the things in that revolution that they have, they have a, a lot of knowledge from past revolutions and not making the same mistakes. And one of the things they, they have done is, I think, yeah, going back to that sense of, of knowing their, their place and doing what's right in their place, uh, balancing their relationship with the system, what they do inside the system and what they, what they do outside of that. And then, and, then, and then simplifying things, you know, because sometimes we just go and, and especially in our academic heads, we just turn to go into more and more and more complex stuff. And then I like the Zapatistas because sometimes they, they really simplify things and they say, you know, there's just two things happening in the world, you know, dichotomy. Usually it's an oversimplification, but it can be a useful one. There are things that contribute to life and a good life and things that contribute to death or a terrible life, you know? And are we working towards the things that contribute to life and that we want to see more of in the world? Or are we contributing to the things that contribute to death and we want to see less of in the world? So I know it's, it's like a really simple equation, but, but what are we doing, you know? So, you know, and, I've, and I found that like, I'm, I'm here living in a rural area in Spain. There's not a lot of, the economy here is not so strong. I, I, don't, have my, I don't have my papers yet. So I'm gonna have to find a job here as, as an engineer, as an academic. So I was trying to do like, maybe like long distance stuff online. And I was looking for just like BS jobs online and, and I got one and, and it works perfectly for me here because it's something I can do remotely have an income and, and, uh, and allow me to have a good life here that I like. But then that income just came from just working for a stupid corporation in the U S that, that I think is terrible. It was, it was uh, just working for like, you know, uh, working as a scorer for Pearson, you know, for a standardized test, you know, something that works perfectly for me here, you know, mm-hmm. and it's just like from home I can do it. And then I have, free time to do all the other things that are actually meaningful to me and to my life, you know, working on my garden, having time to spend with my partner and friends and building community here, uh, uh, playing music, having a, you know, a, a circle for reflection, I don't know, a bunch of different things. But, but that work is BS. And I was working towards something that I think should be less of in the world, which is standardized testing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like okay then then i have to i have to find uh some something else you know and and that's like an easy question but but just that 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 simple you know distinction of yeah does this contribute to life and the life we want or not and the world we want or not you know and and try to do more things that are in the place that we want to be and less less in the world that you know everything we buy how we get our money how we spend our money how we live with less money or with more you know all, all, all these things, you know. Yeah, there's, there's this phrase that people throw around that we're in a time between worlds and it's impossible to escape all the contradictions that we're embedded in. Um, and then there's this other idea that we had a podcast on this idea of dual process theory by Morris Berman, where we, we necessarily have a foot in each world and none of us are, are pure or free of contradictions. Um, we have to survive, we have to put food on the table and within the current system, but we also have to try and work towards the good, right? This, this, this regenerative path uh, and, and, you know, maybe slowly move resources from one system to the other, right? Um, I, going back to this, this notion of the educational academia system, um, in our, when we interviewed Josh, uh, you know, we, we were talking about this idea, well, one, of para-academic, right? Like, can we develop kind of alternative academic structures that actually serve people um, and our, our place-based knowledge that can perhaps be adapted? And then the other idea that a few of us thrown around is the idea of bioregional field schools, where, you know, perhaps, you know, in our ideal scenario moving forward, you know, we actually start creating these place-based educational institutions that you know are the education is itself engaging in this regenerative activity um and i know some people in certain parts of the world are, are starting to to do that or trying to do that like joe brewer and bar Columbia columbia is one example 
Um, I, I really, I, I, I currently teach at Appalachia State University and it's a pretty good department. It's called sustainable development, but I, my vision for it is also to convert it into a field school basically. <laughs> and I'm curious what you think about, you know, uh, a little bit more about what you think about this, these, these kind of more wholesome educational pathways that we can, we can develop. Josh, you want to take on that? We're just kind of talking about this amongst ourselves from time to time. And so we're kind of, um, we're stuck on a few things, but we're hoping you're going to clear them up for us right now. <laughs> no, pre no pressure at all. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I mean, okay. No. I want to think about it this way. So you're in Spain, you're in Southern Spain, you're not far from Grenada. I'm sure there's like some universities and stuff around there. Uh, you know, have you had any act, inter interaction with them? Do you desire to have any interaction with them? Can you imagine how, because like you're saying, like, okay, around the fringes of these institutions, you'll find all kinds of people doing really interesting stuff, figuring out ways to utilize the resources are there in these giant institutions and turn them towards all these kind of weird creative things and stuff. So there is a kind of like fringy potential for a lot of this kind of thing. And so I don't know if you're, if you have any interactions or anything with, 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 with universities around in Spain right now, but you could probably riff for a while and think up this idea of like para academia. I think some of it at least is motivated by the idea that, you know, there's a lot of interesting research that could be done where if you're sort of working at a grassroots level, you can see like, oh, if we understood these things here, then we could apply this kind of thing here. And, you know, it, it's like, like looking at um, um, constructed wetlands and waste stabilization ponds as more like low tech eco sanitation options because they're lower energy input, they could fit in, it, it, uh, it, they have a bigger footprint. So where land is cheap, where labor is cheap, uh, they're not high tech and dependent on too many moving parts and that sort of thing. Um, but then of course the refrain you always hear is like, okay, well, if you approach some giant institution with an idea like that, that's oh, it's so hard to get funding. It's so hard to get funding because it's not on the radar of the big, you know, the sort of like uh, the temple of high tech, you know, space age stuff, right? But that doesn't mean that the potential, I mean, the potential is obviously there, but that doesn't mean that the potential to actually make it happen. You know, there are other creative, mm -hmm. you know, outside ways of making this kind of stuff happen. So, you know, you're an excellent researcher yourself. So like, if you wanted to express that part of your personality doing research on these really practical things, what are some ways you could imagine creating those opportunities for yourself and others to do this real grassroots practical research? Yeah, maybe maybe part of my existential crisis right now is my lack of an, a good answer to that question. <laughs> and it's part of my the big search uh, in my life right now, you know, because because I, I was I was trained within within the system. And like like you said, you know, I was school good at school, so you go to college and then you go to research and you get a scholarship and you do this and you're you're in this path. So you become an expert at this path. You know, because education gives us these two things. Institutional education gives us two main things, you know. It teaches us a particular line of knowledge, but that's only half of it. The only half is that it teaches us to be obedient to walking the path that you have to walk to be successful at that and get the diploma. So your diploma actually says you're, a, you're an engineer in water sanitation. Uh, you know, you know a lot about water and sanitation, and you know a lot about following the path, the institutional path, and what, you know, other people tell you is a good path to walk on, you know? So, uh, yeah, so, so we are not getting trained to create new paths, you know? So, and we need, and we need new paths, you know? So, so, so we need, and I, and I think at, at, at the, at the lower levels uh, of education, you know, like primary, secondary schools, there's been like a lot of different models for more free education. And we see a lot of those, uh, like in this region and, and all over the place are opening up. Most of the times they're, they're on, a, on a private level and sometimes inaccessible to a lot of people. But, but there, there are, you know, alternative kind of free schools, you know, for primary and, and secondary school, right? Or maybe up to uh, middle school level and such, you know. Sometimes they're yeah, prohibitive for, for economic reasons. But, not. But, but, but the structures and the concepts are, are there, you know. The, Waldorf and Montessori and all type of, all types of free schooling, um, and I'm not I'm not I'm not sure. I, I mean I, I see other different paths of generating like higher level knowledge and, and research that I that I see, 
but I, I don't I don't see those uh, like in a into a philosophy or a structure or an institution. I don't see too many examples of those that create clear paths for developing and and expanding and sharing and sharing that that knowledge. You know, you have to be um, or I don't know. At least it, it is it is difficult for me. You know, because you know may, maybe I'm I'm good at working as as part of a team or at, but but it's hard for me to create those those paths. You know, so. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I don't really know. I know, I know in, in Mexico, for example, there's uh, uh, Unitierra, among others. There's like these institutions that are that are that try to, you know, flip the the, the higher level education on its head, where they're just like spaces for really sharing knowledge, you know, uh, without necessarily the the hierarchy of the professors and and the students, but just yeah, places for for sharing knowledge, and you know, and and as you grow up, and and you know, you become an adult and absorb new knowledge, and and get to do research on your own, and you get together with other people who are doing the same, then you kind of, you know, you start to to develop and 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 exchange upper level knowledge, you know, which is which is the equivalent of 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 a, of a university or other academic institution of, of higher education, you know. Um, so, so I mean, so, so something like that could be, and 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 the reality is, you know, people at at all in all walks of, of life, you know, they 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 understand what's good knowledge if if something works, you know, if something works, regardless of 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 whether or not you get a diploma for it or if it's if it's recognized by an institution or not. So there's this type of natural organic process by which you know knowledge that is good will reproduce and expand usually you know i don't know if it's a to darwinian uh theory of knowledge but uh it can be kind of dangerous in a in this like post-truth kind of world where a lot of bs information is also um expanding but but i think at, at, the, at the ground level you know if you turn off like the internet and the news and and uh, all that information the stuff that happens at the ground it expands when it's shared and it works, you know, and then it's, and then it's shared uh, further. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if, if there's like uh, um, uh, a system or an institution that can kind of uh, take on that, on that way of creating, generating, expanding and sharing knowledge, you know, but I think that will be part of a basis of, of something like that, of an alternative to this, this, um, to this academic system that that still is embedded in the system and create this power and reproduces you know the power structures of the system and the the political and economic power structures of of other parts of the of the system you know yeah well said i mean that I, I feel like that aligns a lot with what we talk about a lot in the doomer optimism space how i frame it is kind of we need more proofs of concept that we can share over the network um, and we have this affordance of the internet, which is just a tool like everything else, depends on which values you bring into it, but it does allow us the opportunity to very rapidly diffuse knowledge that is based in, in reality, if we choose to use it that way. Um, and that's, that's kind of my hope, right? Like that's, if I, if you, someone were to ask me, you know, what, makes you the most hopeful about the future of humanity, it's that capacity to create these alternative networks of knowledge where we, we transfer not just theoretical knowledge, but proofs of concept. And we see, okay, like this, you know, whatever it is, this, this water system, you know, this food system, these elements work here really well. How can we think about um, how it could be adapted in a new local context? Um, and kind of, you know, to create some new hybrid, you know, thing that, that of course is also connected to traditional practices, um, et cetera. Yeah, definitely. I, I would add to that. Yeah, I mean, I think in a, if, you, if, you, if you look at it at, at the ground level, you, you develop a proof of concept, you show it, somebody gets it, somebody reproduces it and, and, and it keeps uh, expanding of course if you make it free and more available higher chance you know for someone to take it and 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 do it if you demonstrate it rather than explain it then higher chance for people to take it and do it and some and maybe 
and maybe that process will be slow just because you know you mentioned you know we want to rapidly you know share these mm -hmm. things but at the same time we also have to I, you know to get used to to things being slow once again you know because yeah. there, 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 there were i mean the reason why we are completely destroying our planet and our habitat is not because we're too slow you know, it's because we're we're acting too fast in in the things that are not good, and of course we want the the good things to to be faster, you know, and grow and grow faster. But also, you know, just dismantling all this all this all these notions, you know, of what what more of the system is is inside of us than we th than we think of, you know, and maybe you know slow processes, you know, right? and and allow things to change more slowly. It's okay. Like in these traditional communities in, in Mexico, you know, when you go there and you talk to them about, hey, let's, let's uh, clean your water. The first thing you say, this is another colonialist project. You know, the reason why we exist here and we still are speaking our native language is because every person that talks and looks and dresses like you, we've kicked out of here, you know. If it were because of that, all the nice, all the nice native communities in 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 America, you know, in the Americas that receive their visitors, mm -hmm. colonizers, invaders with 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 open eyes, with open arms, I mean, they disappear. So they're no longer here to tell that story of how nicely they open up their arms to their invaders. You know, the only ones that remain are the ones that are very very cynical and distrustful of anything that comes nearby so actually that that degree of, of distrust is actually what's kept them alive you know what yeah. keeps them alive so we go there and we say oh let's do this thing you know and of course it's going to be a slow process of gaining trust and that's a good thing because that's the thing that keeps them alive you know in, in one way and 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 that just that that's just an example but then there's there's uh there's many things you know where 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 maybe slowing down change mm. can be a, a, a good thing. And if it's a good thing, it will, it will happen, you know, eventually. But we, we have to have that, I don't know, that blind hope, you know, that faith, you know, I think that's part, I think that's, that's the optimist part of the, of, the, of the doomer, I feel, in me, you know, mm. that I think if, if something is meant to happen, it will happen, you know, whether it's our survival or our demise. But... Uh, <laughs> Let's let's try let's try and put all our hearts and minds into that being our survival. Yeah. But if but if it is our demise, it's it's also, uh, you know, we, we would so, have earned our demise. So with that in mind, I think it's a really interesting point that you make that you know it's potentially an adaptive feature of a lot of these traditional communities throughout the Americas to be a bit standoffish towards outsiders, and that may have helped preserve them against others that sort of uh, were too permissive to what the outsiders were up to. And of course, and I mean, in recent years, you know, there have been a proliferation of all these programs of going abroad and engineering for developing communities and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, I mean, I don't know, maybe actually the best thing that people could do is stay home, just leave, leave countries alone, leave the world alone. You know, like we're, we're meddling, aren't we? Are we just going around and meddling in all these communities without knowing what we're doing? And, uh, you know, um, should we call a moratorium on all these kind of new programs that are being developed to send people abroad to do all this kind of stuff? Or is this just like so, sort of the working out of our culture has just got to get it out of its system? Or like, or, um, you know, or am I missing something? It's, it's actually good. I mean, we're just not realizing the good part of it yet. Or what's, what's up? Hey, Josh, can I, add, can I add, something, uh, add something to your question? Uh, you know, and, and also I think that the assumption is always the knowledge goes from say the global north to the global south. Whereas you've talked about, well, actually these slow, quote slow, you know, uh, skeptical, not so permissive communities probably have more to teach people in the global north, especially in the United States consumer culture society that's, you know, completely destroying the planet, um, destroying other cultures. You know, if any, if there's knowledge transmission that needs to go in any direction, it's probably in, in the other direction. Um, it's probably, you know, we need to take like what you're saying, Josh, of maybe we do need to stay home and learn how to slow down ourselves and take a cue from these other cultures that we've been quote unquote trying to save cynically for, for many decades now. So anyway, that's just a comment or appendage to your question. Go ahead. <laughs> 
Yeah, for sure. Yeah, uh, on that definitely, I think there's a lot that we can learn from from communities that are that are that are ancient and are, are pre-industrial. I mean, and in their pre-industrial way of life, they were not destroying their habitat, and and you know they were living in a more sustainable way and stuff. So, um, yeah, in in that framework of the developed and and underdeveloped, it's you know that that's well. I mean, we can go for hours about how how completely upside down and ridiculous that 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 definition is just because you know there's a develop that are the, the destructive we can we can change the word from developed to destructive and and unsustainable to you know to some degree underdeveloped or whatever you want to call it but but actually sustainable and, and more balanced in so many ways um so yeah definitely the exchange of knowledge there can be can be massive if we actually go there with open arms and open eyes in, into a real interaction and those networks that you're talking about i mean i, I will connect this to just say should, should we just like should everyone just stay home or should we just go help others or what well there's a middle ground which is actually building a real network of solidarity and real exchange of knowledge and 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 things like this because you know, those those communities that, that have lived in the past in a traditional and in a traditional way, you know, pre-industrial way and, and all that stuff, their world is actually, is actually now changing as well. You know, they didn't cause these changes, but their world is changing. They're getting less water, you know, less, you know, or less predictable and stuff. So they're actually being affected. So actually there's knowledge from the places that maybe we inhabit that can be useful to them in this new world that's happening, uh, in, this, in the, the new way that, that the world is, is, is working now. So now to them, it's just something that, that's a mystery that water used to come in this time of year and now it's no longer coming and they have no idea what's happening, why or, or what can they do about it. And maybe there's useful knowledge because you know, we have access to all, all, this, all this information from academia and all this stuff, people studying climate and all this. So that can, that can actually be useful to them. So I think this is this is one space where this interaction can be useful, you know, not in telling them they should change their ways of life that have worked for them for ages, but in the things that are that are now changing because the world is changing, they they may have some there may be some useful information for them uh, now. So basically, in the things we're screwing up for them. <laughs> And we know that we're screwing them up and how and what to do about it. Maybe that's a good place for interaction. Um, you know, if we're polluting a river that they've been drinking water out of that river for ages and it's been great, but now there's a, there's a, there's a, you know, a fossil fuel or like a gas extraction line before that's leaking or, you know, like th there's a leak or something upstream of them and they have no idea. Now if they have access to that, it might be a good thing, you know? Or a government project comes in, giving them uh, GM, you know, genetically modified seed and fertilizer for it and herbicides for it, and they don't know the toxicity of that thing because it, it's not explicitly uh, told to them. Uh, then that's a, that's a useful place, you know, to have this interaction. You know, when the when the problems and and the consequences of of the modern society and this destructive extra extractivist. Um, system, an exploitative system, is actually affecting those communities. So bringing that knowledge to them might be a useful place. Um, so I think that and that, yeah, that area of, of true solidarity as equals, as, you know, just people from all different backgrounds and different experiences, sharing knowledge, information, and resources on, an, on, an, on a level uh, field, you know. And again, I'm going to point to Josh to say that he's doing that kind of stuff really awesomely with with this uh, uh with the activated carbon uh, research and work and and bringing that expertise and knowledge and awareness to you know the global community the academic community but also to local communities and not only uh the the issues with with uh with organic contaminants but actually solutions to those to those problems in their drinking water Okay, I'm going to deflect. I'm going to deflect again from that. <laughs> Real quick, Josh. Shameless plug. We interviewed Josh on all, exactly all of these things a few episodes back. Josh Kern. So, if you want to hear about all the awesome work Josh has been doing, we we have a whole episode on it. So, continue. Yeah. No, uh, I just thought of something. So, I remember when we were at CU in grad school, 
you had um, quite a bit of involvement with some student activism that was going on at the time around uh, the issue of trying to get the university to divest from like its investments with fossil fuels and that sort of thing as, as a as approach for mitigating climate change. So I was wondering if you could kind of look back on your experiences with the student divestment act activism and um, kind of give an assessment on how that went. And, you know, if you're going to be kind of hard nosed and objective about it, was it an effective act type of activism? Was it not effective? Or like, what is your sort of uh, critical assessment of that, that you participated in directly yourself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was, I guess, yeah, that attempt that so I think that falls in the category of, of being inside the system, inside the academic system, inside the structures, and, and trying to, uh, if not make it more congruent, at least bring to light the incongruences and the, you know, the lack of, of coherence between the stated uh, values of the institutions and, and, their, and their actions, you know. So, you know, I, activism has, has, has this different, uh, I guess, aims or objectives, you know, one is, is bringing, bringing awareness, uh, one is trying to push the institutions to move in, in a direction that you think are, uh, that are congruent with your, with your values or the stated values of those institutions. And uh, yeah, so, I mean, in terms of, did we get to, uh, you know, divest the, the the money that CU had invested in in fossil fuels. No, we didn't. We didn't achieve that. You know, did we make a lot of noise and and brought attention to the fact that that uh, even this sustainable green, you know, green looking university, whatever that that claims that they're doing all this great climate research and they are doing this and they're pulling people in because of how green and sustainable Boulder and and CU is and stuff. That they are that it's complete BS, and in the background they're they're investing into the destruction of the planet just like anyone else. Like they're betting, like we're gonna keep exploiting fossil fuels to the last drop, and we are going to make a profit from it, you know. And if this doesn't happen, we're actually gonna lose money. So we really want all this fossil fuels to be exploited, you know. So like we're actually putting like, you know, our economic interest pinned against our our ecological, social, and 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 uh, survival uh, interests, you know? Uh, so, you know, bringing awareness to that among the student body and as part of a, of a wider uh, movement, I guess it, it helps uh, to, bring, to bring that awareness. The, the, uh, the extent to which that's, that's really effective, I don't know, because you're, you're bringing, yeah, you're dealing, you're dealing in, a, in an area that's, that's kind of shaky because it's, yeah, trying to, trying to make the institutions better and also trying to, play around with the market, with the market forces, you know, if, if this looks bad enough, then the market will respond to it, you know, like Coca-Cola saying recycle, recycle your plastic, you know, like they just, they, they just look so bad that they want to look good and they want to do, they want to do something good so they don't look bad, you know, so um, it, it's kind of this thing, you know, trying to, to, um, you know, what, what, what would be the, the, the word, you know, to, um, to uh, the, the words shaming, you know, trying to shame these institutions and stuff um, by exposing their, their hypocrisy and all this stuff. So I don't know, does, does that work uh, in the, in the long term? Uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't really know. But I think bringing awareness and conscious of this, of this uh, contradictions and hypocrisies is, is, is a good thing, you know, like, mm -hmm. like in that, in that dichotomy that I was telling you about, you know, is this a good thing that more people know that, that, that the institution is being uh, incongruent and incoherent in their values? Is it a good thing that more people know about it and raising awareness ab about it? Yes. Is this the most effective or is it successful at the ultimate goal of, of uh, shifting away from fossil fuels, I don't know. You know maybe a drop in the bucket, but I think one uh, one from the place where from the inside. Yes, I think one contradiction that that actually our our colleague Ashley brings up a lot is, you know, when we're when we're trying to shut down pipelines and and close off the taps of you know oil production or coal mining or something, but we're not simultaneously changing our lives. To require much less energy input, 
that doesn't make any sense, right? Because if we if we were to shut off, you know, uh, you know, fossil fuel extraction today, and we 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 haven't built the alternatives, we would die. Like, we would, you know, a lot of people would die. Um, probably not the Zapatistas; they they'd probably be just fine. But many people say in the United States would, um, and so. It, it, it seems like you need to have, in order to have a coherent approach, you know, yeah, like fighting against the system, standing up for the system, pointing out the hypocrisies is, is great, but you, you have to be, you have to be moving towards the next thing, right? You have to be building communities that are more sustainable, <laughs> that are more resilient, that require less energy, that probably produce a lot more of their own food, are less dependent on global supply chains, et cetera. Um, I don't know, that's just, that's just one thought. Yeah, definitely. I think that being, that being congruent and, you know, reducing our, our, our own needs for all that is, is true. That's, that's definitely true. And then, but then also at the same time, the reason why we're doing, why, why we're using this fossil fuel and, and like other destructive technologies, is not because there's a group of people who wants to destroy the earth, mm. you know, it's just because they're making more money out of it than other things, you know. So if you make it more painful to them and more disruptive to them, what's going to happen is not that we're going to shut down all the production of, of fossil fuels or things like that. What's going to happen is you're going to start shifting to where other, like the other things are going to become more economically feasible uh, compared to that, you know? So you're just kind of pushing, pushing in that, in that direction will be like raising the awareness and, and pushing in that, in that, in that direction from from two ways you know which is with the the um, you can say the the moral or ethical side of things and the the economic side of things will be the market the market forces you know and mm -hmm. and since then you know i i have seen in the news more and more of this like investment firms and all of that creating green funds you know that 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 have this um what do you call it esg um uh you know i um uh, filtering or something I don't remember where but they have like environmental social and governance um, you know they filter the investment so they are not investing in fossil fuels and weapons and right other, one, of the I, one of the, the, so, the really uh, I think cynical things I've seen about ESG though <clears throat> like the environmental designation right like if a company gets a good environmental designation so an ordinary person like you're amazed. I think, oh, that means they did, they planted trees or they did some, they did carbon or they did some gesture to try to make something better for the environment, right? And they got a good environmental rating. Like that's how that works. So it's different than that, right? Like if Nestle gets a good environmental rating, what it means is like for a particular Nestle plant, they did a good job building resilience into that Nestle plant so that if climate change occurs and sea level comes up, that plant is still going to be able to make profits. Like they protected themselves from environmental calamity. And so they got a good environmental rating on the ESG. <laughs> or like, you know, it, uh, maybe they're in a country where there's like a dictatorship or something like that. But they have, you know, inroads with the dictator and they're paying them off or something. So they get a good government rating because the government is not likely to interfere with the profitability of the plant. So I feel like it's really, it's one of these like dark, dark things where it's like, you think it's this, you know, they're getting, oh, they're working with government to make government. Like, That's great. They're making the environment better. It's like, no, they protected themselves against instability of those other factors so that they'll continue to provide returns to shareholders, even, you know, when the going gets tough. And I remember reading that and just going, oh my God, man, what kind of world are we living in? Yeah, so that's just like the system, like protecting itself against anything that you will try to make the system better at, you know. Uh, so yeah, so I mean, so that, that that's just like the the question always, you know, like can you work within the system and make the system better? Or do you need to just like go outside of it, you know, or or know where to interact with 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 the with the system, you know? But yeah, it can be really disheartening. That, that kind of stuff yeah. yeah whenever you try to to work with like market forces is like i mean are you ever gonna do anything truly good you know i i you know are the good people in world who have good intentions uh i'm gonna are, can can we really like affect this system that's not meant for for good intentions it's not meant for bad intentions it's just not meant for it's not made for that you know it's just made for 
So, okay. Make any money. Yeah, no, no, no. follow-up question is, and you probably have the answer to this. At what point do, does a coalition form, a militant coalition form between the Zapatistas and the Amish, and they sweep over all of North America and straighten this shit out? Uh, <laughs> that's like 89% viable, I will say. <laughs> but what, 84% of the statistics are made up on this spot? I don't know. Yeah. yeah maybe that's fine. But it's totally doable. They share so many values, so many things, at a, I think at a much more profound level that, that, than you can imagine. The Zapatistas, they already left their, left their arms. They, they laid down their arms and their weapons just in case the Amish have a, have, have a concern about that. They have some great texts about how they, they raised up their, their arms, uh, their weapons, just to lay them down. And um, yeah, they're not just uh, protecting themselves. It's like, like anyone else is trying to live a, a good, peaceful life. You know, uh, the, the military is structure is no longer at the top. It's a civilian uh, governing and all that stuff. So probably more in common than you think with the Amish. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, the irony of this thought experiment is that the Zapatistas are, are generally thought of as left wing and the, the Amish, if not necessarily thought of as right wing, are definitely thought of as very conservative. And yet, when we're talking, when we're when we're accounting for this whole different axis of place-based living, they're highly aligned. And so it's just an interesting how how the political categories and, and how we divide ourselves in a neoliberal capitalist system, you know, oftentimes don't actually make a lot of sense. Yeah, definitely. And I think part of the evolution, like political, economical, uh, social evolution is, is letting go of those of those things. Just like we have to let go of the concept of development and the nation state and the countries, you know, and our flags, also the left and right. Like it's, it's gone. I mean, I feel I still I mean, I'm going to be totally honest. I feel very far on the on the left, you know, but but still I see these examples and I, and I feel those those definitions. They're, they're less and less uh, useful, you know? Like, what are the things that matter to you, you know? And it's not left or right, you know? You want, you want autonomy, you want freedom to live your life in a meaningful way, in your place, you know, with, with your people, you know? Yeah. That's, that's, that, that's at, the, at, the, at the bottom of that and the bottom of, of most of our, of, our, of our hearts, you know? Yeah. Simone, I think we're gonna wrap up pretty soon, but I wanna give you the opportunity if there's any question you wished we had asked or you wish somebody would, would, would ask you or, or something else you just want to express to, to leave the audience with, uh, the floor is yours. Oh, wow. Uh, no, I mean, I'm just really grateful for, for this space and just this, this, this way of thinking. I just, the, the, thought, the thought that I had, <clears throat> that I had before just to, to wrap up with the, what the Doomer optimist um, idea brings to my to my own mind is is this you know that that the the doom is coming you know and an end is coming to a, to a, there's the end of an era certainly mm -hmm. um and there's great potential for that and that's a great thing you know that things have to things have to change because we we are cyclical you know i think in our you know western capitalist way of thinking patriarchal you know all this all these words that we want to throw in there we, we usually think of things being pretty linear you know, we go, we go up, 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 and then, but I think things are, are very cyclical, you know, so a doom is just the beginning of, 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 of a river, rebirth, and, and whether or not we as a species and our, our system and our structures are on the other side of that, of that, um, of that valley, well, no, it's, it's an open question, but whatever needs to happen will happen, you know, if, if we actually develop the conscience as a species, to to overcome that valley and and make it through to the other side and thrive on the other side and the other side of the collapse of this of the system uh, that's great those are great news because I think we've done <clears throat> we've built beautiful things um, along the way <clears throat> excuse me but if we don't make it then we would have earned that that disappearance from the face of the earth and this earth will be better without us so <clears throat> I'm an optimist about whatever happens. You know. Hopefully we make it. There's beautiful, there's beautiful music, poetry, love, community, not so things that we have done and built together as a species. And it's just overwhelmingly beautiful and it will be great for more and more people and generations and those to come to experience those and to learn those and continue to expand those. 
But if it's our time to go, then it's our time to go. And then where will be one more fell species on the on the long list of on this earth, and we'll let that earth continue to be for for other more fit and you know more conscientious uh, species that are that are more fit to to inhabit this beautiful planet. You know, mm. <laughs> beautiful. Josh, any other guys? Thank you so much for this space. I wish I wish you guys had spoken more. Like, come on, Josh, take it home. <laughs> uh, they get to hear us talking now. No, that's really good, man. I, I, that's something I always love is that, you know, you're so often smiling and you're having such uh, an ebullient and joyful demeanor, despite, you know, you know, the facts of the situation. Mm -hmm. And you find all this, you find these like these threads of good and gold to, to latch onto. So I appreciate that a lot. That's why I knew it'd be a good conversation for this crowd. Cause it's easy to kind of go into the dark hole when, when things get bad and you always pull it back out. And I love the equanimity, like, Hey, if it's our time to go, you go. <laughs> the earth will be right. You know, like that's a good way to think about it. Just do what you can, man. Just do what you can. Uh, you know, don't sweat the small stuff, and it's all small stuff. So, mm -hmm. for sure, man. Cool. Thanks, guys. This is this is great.